Um, and as long as you have that situation, the economy drains away, drains away. You go down to the glittering new center of rebuilt Beirut, which is effectively a Sunni Muslim Christian center, and there's nobody there. A million dollar businesses are just becoming bankrupt almost every day. Thousands and thousands of people out of work. It's a very serious drain on the treasury, it's a drain on the donors, it's certainly a drain on the government. And now you have the government, most of the ministers, for fear of their lives, living in the government centre, surrounded by barbed wire and watchtowers and soldiers. It looks like a miniature version of the Iraqi Green Zone. Nobody respects the Iraqi government in Iraq. So who's respecting the Lebanese government in Lebanon? Uh, Hezbollah also uh, feels uh, this other, uh, there's a social aspect of them providing, uh, like after the war they provided 10 to 12,000 uh, American dollars to families who lost their home. Per apartment. Per apartment. Per apartment. Mm -hmm. um, Brand new hundred dollar bills, by the way. And I think, I think a lot of people um, when in, the, in, in the United States, when you think of Hezbollah, because of, you, you talked earlier about the word, use of the word terrorist, mm. that's, the, that's the immediate thing. Well, that's because of your television and newspapers. Mm -hmm. That's not because of events in the Middle East. No, of course. Uh, you know, I mean, one of the problems you have in the United States is that once you put the Middle East through the filter, of the very gutless and cowardly reporting of your country's journalists. Um, it, it filters out into what the White House wants, or the Pentagon wants, or the State Department wants, or you know, the Republican Party wants, or whatever. Um, you know, I mean, I can open, as I did this morning, the New York Times here. I don't want to read it, but it's about the only paper I can buy. And its coverage of the Middle East is absolutely, for me, incomprehensible. It is so frightened of telling the truth. You know, it calls the wall, the fence, it calls occupied territories, disputed territories. It calls colonists, colonies, settlements or outposts, I mean, neighborhoods. Um, when you have this diminution of the semantics of this great tragedy, as you do in the American press, where anyone who opposes the United States power or opposes Israel becomes a terrorist, you're no longer dealing in reality, you're dealing in fantasy, which is why Bush said at the end of the summer war in Lebanon, um, Hezbollah lost. Well, that's not what the Israelis think. <laughs> they think they lost, and they're right. Um, but this is the same man who believes things were getting better in Iraq, and, and has got a great future, and there's, you know, um, 650,000 dead since 2003. We deal now, unfortunately, with governments of fantasies, and our own dear Mr. Blair is one of them. And the saddest part is that our own colleagues, despite all that they learned of the lies of, you know, weapons of mass destruction and so on in the, before the Iraq invasion, they're doing the same again with Iran. They're saying exactly the same things about Iran as they said about Iraq. They're playing the government line. And our job as journalists should be to challenge authority. And as long as we don't do that, as long as we become mouthpieces, as long as you know, the spokesman, um, as long as the correspondent at the Pentagon is in effect the spokesman for the Pentagon, people will go on believing Hezbollah is a terrorist organization. Of course they will. And they'll go on believing that the Israelis are the good guys. And they will delete from the record the fact that uh, less than 200 Israeli civilians died last summer's war and more than 1,000 Lebanese civilians died. That tells you something. But it's not discussed. It's not discussable. It's not part of the narrative. That's the problem. How, how have conflicts with Israel, um, how has that shaped the political landscape of Lebanon? Well, you know, um, depends which side. Lebanon can say it has the misfortune to live next to Israel, and the Israelis can say they have the misfortune to live next to Lebanon. Um, look, Israel is the only superpower in the region. The only other possible contenders were Iran under the Shah, and he fell, and Iraq under Saddam, and we know what happened to him. Um, but the problem you see, the problem for Lebanon is that it is on the one hand a very dangerous country for foreigners, but on the other hand a totally powerless country. I mean its army counts for nothing. Um, you know, it has no oil, has no economic power, 41 billion dollars in debt. Who wants to get involved in Lebanon? But all the world does. The Americans go there and get blown up, the French go there, UNIFIL has so many, we've got four NATO generals, we've got the Spanish army, the Italian army, the French Foreign Legion, the Syrians outside who were just in Lebanon, uh, there used to be Iranian revolutionary guards, as there haven't been for 15 years now. Everyone wants to be involved in Lebanon. H heaven knows why. Just like every Christian wants to be the president of Lebanon. Heaven knows why. Um, you know, I think that because Israel is a very warlike state, most Israelis would agree, um, to live next door to it is a very dangerous um, occupation. <laughs> Whether you be the Syrians and basically don't have any friction, or whether you be the Lebanese, or you have constant friction, courtesy of the Syrians and Iranians. 
whether you be Jordan that cowers every time the new settlement is built, whether you be Egypt that realizes that it doesn't love Israel at all and Israel doesn't love Egypt, but it had a peace treaty, of course, under Saddam. Um, until there is a genuine peace based on UN Security Council resolutions, I'm talking about 242, of course, withdrawal of Israeli forces from territory captured in the 67 war in return for security of all states in the area, including Israel, there will be no peace and Lebanon will suffer.